welcome. I will close that. I will show you the Mentimeter. You can join the, uh, the Mentimeter here. And we will talk about Golang. So first, a uh, short introduction. Um, who am I? Um, so I am a lecturer in the computer science department. I work with Christopher uh, and Shamak. I am um, lecturing. I, I was lecturing game programming, game design, mobile programming cloud with Christopher. I've been lecturing quite a broad range of courses. I enjoy teaching programming a lot. So that's why I'm kind of offloading Christopher here. I'm also a researcher. I'm researching decentralized systems. I'm, I'm really interested in how uh, decentralized systems may change the way we organize ourselves as, as humans. Uh, so working with uh, blockchain and cryptocurrencies recently a lot. In the past, I was I was working with multi-agent systems and distributed systems. Um, quite interested in computer architectures and how modern processors and GPUs work also. And I'm a programmer. I'm kind of a keen doing programming and I, you know, I enjoy programming. So if I have some spare time, I like to do some coding or solve some coding puzzles and things like this. Um, so how about you? Um, can you uh, tell me in three words, who are you? How would you describe yourself? I hope it works. Yeah. So use uh, three words to try to succinctly depict who are you, and then we will get a bit of a picture of a, of a class. So we have some programmers, we have some gamers, we have some identity people. <laughs> Yeah, programming engineers, some men, some women, I guess, some curious people. Yeah, we have some women, good. Some fat people, some social people, <laughs> hobbyists, cool. Yeah, gamers and programmers and students are kind of dominating. Ah, looks cool. Some skinny man. All right. What do you guys do for hobbies? I I really like paragliding. So that's me on a low resolution photograph uh, in Nepal, uh, flying on my paraglider. I like running, um, climbing with Rune. I tried to get Christopher into climbing, but yeah, I failed. Same with running. I'll keep, I'll keep trying. All right. Um, you should have some passions. So as a programmers or computer scientists, uh, you do need to do find something that you do outside uh, because otherwise, you know, you're spending your, your days in front of the computer. All right, so in terms of the languages, uh, what sort of languages do you know? Uh, what, can you, what can you use? Perfect. So it looks Go is very niche. We only have, you know, a very small number of people knowing it and using it. So it's great because that course is all about Golang. Um, I mean, not the course, but the, the, the this two weeks. <laughs> you will use Golang for assignments as well. 
such that you should get proficiency in, in Golang through the cloud course. Um, yeah, we have a background in Python. That's probably Python and Java. It's probably the data engineer uh, stream. And we have kind of a large group from C, C++ world. Um, and then we have some enthusiasts uh, using Rust and Haskell, some Golang, some other languages and, and Java and TypeScript. So it's sort of what I have expected. I sort of expected you having background in, in Java, Python, and, and C, C++. Uh, for some of the concepts, um, Golang is very similar to Java. And for some concepts, of course, it's derived from C, C++. So uh, those, the people with background in those two languages will kind of have some, uh, some benefits um, or picking up. All right, so um, what is, what is Go? Um, it's designed by three people. Uh, and if you look up those people on Wikipedia, you will realize that um, Ken Thompson is sort of the, the Unix C person. Uh, he goes way back. Uh, Rob Pike is a um, programming languages enthusiast. He had a number of programming languages he designed in the past. Um, and then uh, Robert Grissemer is another um, Google engineer who works with those, those guys. And they try to think of a language which, um, um, which is for Google, uh, so for server side, uh, you know, whatever that means, uh, and for large teams. Uh, so we'll look a little bit into the, the features of the language, um, but just a, a question for you, like what are different languages used for? So, you know, we know JavaScript and TypeScript are dominating web and browser programming because they were designed to make, you know, browsers more interactive, um, such that it's not strange that they sort of dominate, um, you know, front end in web. Uh, although JavaScript has been used on the back end as well because of Node.js. Um, but you know, what would, what would you say server programming is for? So use the chat because I don't have a question in the, uh, in the Mentimeter. So what, what does server programming means to you? Uh, managing packages. Yes. To some extent. Man manages packets, perhaps network packets, networking. Yes, networking, of course. So in the interacting with databases, so sort of backend, backend side programming. Yeah, very good point. Yeah, <laughs> Yon is saying that uh, Golang is a sneaky ploy to get more programmers to train for potential positions at Google. Uh, pot potentially, yes, Google is using Golang for a lot of their services. Um, yes, so, you know, what Google does, Google designs cloud-based services, and they do deal with networking, they do deal with databases, and they need to do a lot of processing on the server side, on the kind of a cloud side. Uh, the front end is what is facing the, the customers, but the back end and all the server services, they need to do this kind of a heavy lifting and, and all the cloud services um, implementations need to be written in something. And Go was sort of designed as a, as a language, as an answer to how to build that. Uh, there was no clear way of, of doing that before. Uh, because um, C++, you know, some of the uh, backend ser services and uh, performance computing was done in C++ or, or C, uh, but it has certain problems. It is known, it, it's, you know, the C, C++ um, languages are quite heavy in, in terms of you have to spend some time learning them. Uh, you can't you know, spend a week and be quite up to speed with the language. You need to get into it, uh, not to make mistakes and to get the feel of uh, what is the idiomatic way of using it. 
Uh, and you have to deal with memory and build times are quite large. So uh, Google was sort of trying to experiment with various languages on how to improve that. Um, and they kind of had certain objectives. Uh, and one of the objective was that the language should be easy to pick up uh, by people such that you can idiomatically program in it, you know, in a couple of days. Uh, and then the build times should be short uh, because they have to iteratively, you know, compile and build and test and build and test uh, the, the large projects. And that was sometimes done overnight uh, with some large, you know, C++ um, implementations. So they had some, um, some issues with the tools that they were using before. And another one, another big one was concurrency. So if, again, if you check uh, Rob Pike, he was really big into designing languages that deal with concurrency kind of on the language level. Um, and that's what uh, Go is. So it is kind of a descendant of the C family of languages with uh, really fast build times and with the concurrency kind of built in. Um, so here is the, uh, you know, um, small descendant tree of where kind of Go comes from. Uh, and you can see that Pike was sort of uh, designing Squeak and New Squeak. Um, I, I've used New, New Squeak uh, in the past when I was a student. Um, no, I was not a student then, or I, I was a, a, a researcher, uh, a junior. No, I was, I was still a student, I guess. Uh, so anyway, I use Newsquick and the syntax and some of the concepts are very similar to Golang. Um, and of course it is kind of the, you know, a modern C, they, they advertise it uh, when it came up as a sort of a re-implementation of, of C and, you know, adding some um, uh, garbage collector and, and some things that make it sort of a, a modern language. Uh, and then there is a sort of a large line of um, Pascal descendants, which also contributed to the way Go deals with certain constructs. Uh, but the concurrency things is sort of from, uh, from that line. So this, here you have sort of a syntax, here you have some sort of a design of encapsulation and a modularity, like we don't have the typical classes as you would have in C++ or some object-oriented languages. Uh, and here you have the kind of a descendant tree of the how to deal with concurrency which is different than the normal multi-threading uh, paradigm from the p-thread P library. So uh, Go, yeah, started in November 2009 and has gained, you know, uh, some, some popularity over the, the last years. So the main motivation was the productivity of teams. And I will have a question about that in a moment, um, but how they, so, so what they've done, um, they've done the language which has a very rich uh, standard library. So everything to do with networking, everything to do with encryption, everything to do with JSON parsing, it's all in standard libraries. So tomorrow you will see once we start doing some uh, web services and some JSON parsing, that it's super easy. You don't need any de external dependencies. You don't need to deal with the you know uh, dependency nightmares. Uh, it's all part of the language and part of the standard library. So it makes certain typical use cases, such as building a, a web service, very easy. Um, I've built a lot of web services with Node.js and JavaScript in the past, and you always had to have dependencies uh, to do anything. Uh, and then the problem with dependencies is that they change, they migrate, and you have to keep maintaining it. So every couple of months, some libraries change, they become incompatible with some other libraries, and you have to update your entire system to keep up with security patches and, and things like, like that. Uh, here, once we build a, a web service, uh, which we did with Christopher, a couple of them, uh, it just works uh, year after year. You just recompile it and it works. Uh, you don't need to touch your source code um, and maintenance and uh, some of the things are kind of much simpler. So it has, you know, certain benefits. Um, you will also realize that 
if you're coming from C++ or from Rust, which is also pretty slow, uh, that build times for large projects are kind of amazing. So uh, Golang is, is really good to compile relatively large and multi um, depend, uh, projects with, with large dependency trees. Uh, it has integrated toolchain, you know, most modern languages do have that, like uh, Haskell or Rust. Uh, if you're coming from C++, unfortunately, it is, um, it doesn't have that feel that you have everything kind of integrated with the language itself. You have to use IDE and you have to use um, some additional ways of managing your dependencies, whereas with those languages like Go, it's sort of part of the language. Um, so Go is compiled. Um, it's statically typed. It's imperative, but it does have some functional features. And we will dive into that a little bit more on, on Thursday. Um, it has It is different from C because it manages memory for you. So even though uh, Go has pointers and you can allocate dynamically memory, uh, you don't care. I mean, you do care, but you don't manage uh, the release of the memory yourself. The, the runtime system and the language itself will do that for you. Uh, so it manages kind of the memory, uh, memory for you. And it has um, concurrency built in, uh, which means some of the things like running things in parallel, uh, concurrently, I mean, uh, is kind of very easy because the, the constructs on the language level. You don't need a library or you don't need to, to do anything special. You can just concurrently execute functions and then communicate between them using concepts like channels. Uh, we will cover that tomorrow. And it is not object oriented, but it has interfaces and it has structs and methods on structs. So you can use some of the object oriented patterns of programming uh, if you want to using the constructs of the language. Um, and you can also use some functional programming constructs because functions are kind of the, the main you know, mechanism of the language itself. And it, it, it feels really modern. So when uh, we started using it, uh, you know, we uh, liked the, the large ecosystem. In fact, the, there was uh, uh, a person in Node.js uh, world, Halochuk, who was one of the main de um, developers and designers of uh, web um, frameworks and tool, ch tool chains and a lot of support for Node.js. And he actually quit Node.js community and he joined um, Golang and he joined Google. Um, and Golang has a lot of very smart people working for the team uh, such that, you know, of course, the language is criticized and it has um, a lot of uh, quirks that people don't like necessarily. I, I don't like everything about Golang neither, uh, but it is very well designed and it, it has kind of a, a modern feel to, to itself and it's uh, super easy. So some aspects of the language which Google put itself up to achieve, I think they achieved really well. So um, it has relatively easy, but good and comprehensive abstractions. It doesn't have generics. They are kind of working on Golang 2.0 and there are proposals to introduce generics and some metaprogramming into the language, um, which would definitely help with expressing certain, you know, higher order uh, algorithms or, or concepts. But as it is, uh, you do appreciate that it's very easy. Like in some languages, even with C++, if I haven't used C++ for a while and I have to do something, I have to look up what was the syntax or how to use certain things. With Golang, it's almost, I don't need to look up anything. Like it, it's so natural and so small that it, it kind of comes back to you. So even if you didn't program in Golang for like half a year uh, and you come back, you can very quickly pick up and the, the syntax is simple and quite intuitive. Uh, so you can almost always kind of uh, guess what it should be if you kind of forgot. Uh, so it's kind of an easy, easy language. Um, and it, it is kind of really easy for uh, maintenance as well. 
uh, because it enforces certain idiomatic way of coding uh, that for, uh, enforces the coding conventions also because it has a built-in linters and uh, code formatters and all, all of that, uh, such that it, it is easy for, for kind of ongoing maintenance. And as I said, because of the large built-in standard libraries, you don't care about dependencies. Most of the things that you have to build you don't need any external dependencies for. You can just build it with the uh, features of the language itself. Um, of course, if you're doing something very spe specialist in machine learning or computer vision or something like this, of course, you're gonna use some external dependencies because it doesn't have everything built in into standard libraries. But in terms of this course, in terms of the cloud and building uh, web services, um, most of the things that you will need are in the standard library, uh, which is different to languages such as um, Rust, for example, which took slightly different philosophy. And the standard library is very small. And most of the things such as you know encryption and networking, um, dealing with parsing of JSON and so on is done through additional libraries that you have to depend on. Uh, it has its benefits, but it also has its kind of maintenance costs uh, because it kind of partitions your development. Um, and yeah, so I've I've um, mentioned that that it has kind of a tool tooling support. So you have uh, linters, you have uh, verification code verification built in, you have uh, code formatting built in, you have documentation. Uh, generators built in. You have even some uh, code analysis tools built in such that it will check if you uh, should fix certain things. So there is a go fix. Uh, so it will suggest you some improvements into your kind of a coding patterns. And also there is a small concurrency check which uh, warns you if you have a likelihood of uh, race conditions or if you kind of have some threats not closing when the program closes. So you, you have kind of um, all of that built in into a runtime system and into a language, which makes it sort of an excellent choice for, uh, for this course because you do need to build you know, concurrent web services uh, for cloud and you cannot be relying on a single threading solutions because you know you do need to be uh, interacting with multiple clients and accessing a database and you know uh, answering the network requests and things like this. Like you know, concurrency is uh, a primary you know need in server side programming. Um, so all those facilities make GoLang kind of an excellent choice for trying things out. Um, I really like Golang for that. And I really like Golang for uh, building networking solutions, networking applications and cloud services. Um, I like other languages as well, but if I have to do something, like if I have to do a web service, it is by far easiest in, in Golang. You, of course you can do it in other languages as well. Uh, and you might be uh, keen to do that because you know maybe you more proficient in C++ or maybe your team is all proficient in C++ and whatever that the reason is but um, Golang has a lot of advantages and it's super simple uh, such that if you don't know it there is no excuse not to learn it and use it when it, it kind of fits. All right so um, question for you uh, a, a little bit abstractly what do you think? is the most important thing when you're picking a particular programming language or programming paradigm for a given problem. So what are the reasons, what are the um, factors that mm, are important in, in programming, in the choices you're making in programming? So, Fitting in the particular use case scenario, yes. Efficiency, readability, uh, resource usage, it's sort of like efficiency as well. Performance efficiency, yes. Readability, tooling support. Yeah, what platform is supported? Good, very good uh, answers. So documentation, 
uh, how long, you know, in the line length, how long the solution will be. Succinct, shorter solutions sometimes are better. Um, ease of understanding, ergonomics. Security, yes, uh, support, ease of development, ease of documentation, so ease of use generally. Um, yeah, perfect. So uh, those are really good, um, really good points. Um, I kind of grouped, yeah, the size of the solution, um yeah open source i don't have that one so open source is one that i haven't uh, considered but it's a good one also um so some sometimes there is a preference of open source dependency versus you know a commercial lock-in with some commercial uh provider so apart from the open source i kind of uh, grouped them into three things. And I think your, your cloud, uh, your word cloud fits those three categories. Um, so one category is productivity. And what I mean by productivity here is uh, what, you, what you said. Um, yeah, you know, productivity is of documentation, is of development, whether it does the job, solving the task, um, those things, you know, documentation, those things I sort of consider a productivity, a readability. Um, so this is kind of a broad, broadly speaking, productivity category. Uh, the second one is maintenance. So security, how easy it is to introduce bugs, how hard it is to introduce bugs, how long it takes to build. Like if you have to have a build cycle, like you do changes, you build, you check. You do changes, you build, you check. If that cycle is long, you you know, your things kind of slow down, your, I, I call it maintenance. It, it is, they are overlapping, all right? Yeah, if, if you're slow in building, then your productivity is a little bit uh, diminished as well. So it, they are not perfectly separated, but uh, productivity is more how easy and how, you know, efficiently you can uh, do the, um, do the task for yourself and for your team. Maintenance is all those extra things that, you know, some languages are really hard to do bugs in. Like if you get Haskell to compile or Rust to compile, chances are it will run. It will not have bugs. Uh, JavaScript, on the other hand, always runs. <laughs> and the chances you having bugs in what runs are very high, right? So you have to heavily test. Uh, in some languages, you don't need to heavily test because the compiler and the, um, the tooling makes you make prevents you to make you know certain types of bugs. Um, so that's kind of the the middle category. And then the final one is the performance, right? So it, you, you mentioned that as well. How how fast the solution is, how small or how big the executable is. Um, so the raw performance in terms of uh, what. Um, what does the program do uh, in terms of um, metrics like speed or throughput or request per second and so on. There are applications, for example, if you're working on a mobile device and you're interacting with the user, um, whether something takes 500 milliseconds or something takes 700 milliseconds or something takes 20 milliseconds, it doesn't matter. Uh, as long as it's kind of a sub-second interactivity with the user, uh, typically that's fine. If you have a mobile game on the other hand and the game starts lagging, uh, the experience is you know, destroyed and the performance matters a lot. So the, the last one, the performance is subject to the problem at hand. With some problems, you do require the highest performance you can get. Uh, for most tasks, you have to get sort of sufficient performance, uh, the performance that fulfills the requirements, but not more, because doing more will cost you more and it's not needed, right? Um, and in some solutions, the performance is not needed, right? Uh, 
So languages like you know JavaScript or Pascal, they kind of slow. Uh, performance is not their strong point. It's actually they, they are kind of crap. But the performance is not the main thing. Uh, many for many applications that utilize those languages. Uh, flexibility, the ease of development is, but not performance. So, you know, the other tool sometimes trump the last one. Um, so you often have this sort of uh, arguments that they yeah, are coding everything in C++ because it's the fastest. Um, true, uh, it's the often the fastest executable uh, by smaller or larger margin compared to alternatives but it makes you probably less productive here and maybe it makes it harder for maintenance and introduces more bugs and so on right so maybe there are some trade-offs it the answer is never simple uh, the answer is always a little bit multi-dimensional so you you do need to consider all those dimensions um, the argument which programming language to choose or what paradigm to choose is not never really trivial um, it, it, it has to go and balance some of the conflicting objectives. Sometimes the performance is crucial. Like, you know, if you're making a database system or making a, a web service, which should serve millions of people, uh, you know, uh, milliseconds differences make a huge difference in the number of resources you need to serve the requests and how many users per seconds can you, you know, uh, serve. So, but then you know you do you do need to open up for the possibility that there are alternative objectives that are at work here, uh, and I think the cloud your your kind of word cloud covered though those three. Uh, I didn't have the uh, the open source versus proprietary software argument here, but it is uh, it is important in in many cases too. I agree. All right, so um, let's go a little bit about the um tooling so i do have um i do have um well so let's let me first um go to last year uh project um such that i can show you some of those things so if i go yeah like hello world and I open the source file and I mess up the formatting. So I have kind of a formatted code uh, following all the conventions, uh, but I can kind of uh, make it a little bit untidy. And then if I show you the code, it kind of looks untidy. So if I say go format uh, and go format has um, a couple of flags. So dash s, kind of simplifies the code and dash w basically writes the the modification back to the file so if i run it without anything for the current folder it will say look uh, you have some issues you you should reformat your code and it dumps the reformatted golang source code uh, source file into the standard output but if i use uh, the flag so if i say okay simplify the code and dump it into the file that you're analyzing, then it will not output anything to the screen, but it will effectively uh, modify the, the file to the one that it, it should look like, right? So now if we um, if we look at the source file, it, it is it introduced those kind of uh, lines. It uh, used the tabs to move the lines uh, to be aligned properly, and it generally kind of fixed some of the little things that it needed to, to fix, right? So go format is your friend. It's in included in most of the IDEs and it will be formatting your code. So don't fight with it. Like let it format the code as it should and then just co follow the, the conventions, right? Uh, you will notice that uh, Golang is using, yeah, let, let me clear that clutter a little bit and cut it again. So Golang is using kind of the bracket conventions. So at the end, you know, in, in, in C and C++, you have two types of bracket conventions. One kind of starts here and closes here. So they are matching. And one sort of starts at the end of line and closes here. Uh, so in Golang, this is the enforced coding conventions for brackets. 
and it's a compiler error if you do um, so if I um, if I move this bracket here so um, if I try to follow this other coding convention if I do this um, you see my uh, I'm using a very simple ID but it's already complaining it's an error it's a compiler error to have a bracket here it's not a style it's a compiler error so which it is which is kind of interesting that um, they thought um, <laughs> the bracket placement is such a big deal that it's not enforced by the linter and the coding conventions it's enforced by that compiler itself right um, so what else do we have? Uh, we have um, go fix. Uh, you know, with this simple program, I don't have any problems. So go fix is not gonna fix anything, but you can run go fix on your projects and it will kind of suggest some simplifications and some things to make things easier um, and more readable. And again, it's kind of integrated with most IDEs and it, the IDE will kind of use the go fix to, to help you. Of course you have linters, uh, but um, I am not using the, um, the e extension tool uh, linter, which comes with Golang. I'm using the um, more comprehensive Golang CI lint runner. Uh, and you can, uh, you will find the resources in the, uh, in the course. What is lint? Uh, good question. So if, you have your source code, for example, like this. Uh, there are certain elements of the source code that are here. So for example, you have the, the package, which is on the top of the file. You have your imports, um, and then you have your documentation. So comments about the functions or methods that you have. And then you have the source code itself with some statements and the placement of the brackets the, the placement of those brackets, uh, whether you have space here or here or not. Um, all of those elements kind of form kind of a coding style and, and coding conventions. And the linter is a tool that enforces certain coding conventions and certain documentation style and certain way of structuring your source code. Uh, so, um, we use Lint for C++ and C. We use Lint for most programming environments, such as to enforce certain st standards for source code, right? Uh, it is, it depends. So some linters are configurable and you can enforce certain standards which are for the team. Uh, certain things like, for example, in Golang are enforced by the language itself, such that you have to follow the standards, you cannot vary them. Um, and in the past, when we were using, for example, Java, there was a, uh, originally Sun Microsystems and then subsequently Oracle designed standard, which was for coding in Java. And then you have a certain set of rules which you can instruct your linter and then um, the, the linter for Java was kind of enforcing that. Uh, most IDEs, most the integrated development environments that you use will have this type of lint built in and they usually kind of highlight some issues as a, as a warning saying, oh yeah, you should fix this or you should reorder this or you should put documentation because you're missing and so on. So for example, in Golang, it's it's kind of it's not enforced by the language, but it's enforced by the linter that you should have documentation for functions, and the documentation for functions should start with the name of the function as the first word of the documentation, such that if I didn't have this documentation here uh, for the publicly export function, uh, the linter would complain. And also if I didn't have this uh, first uh, word here, um, the linter should complain as well that I'm not following the, the, the standard. That's right. So uh, lint helps a lot when you're collaborating with others. Lint helps at all, a, a lot with your own projects to make it consistent across your code base to have the same kind of a coding conventions and coding standards. And it unifies 
the readability and the ability to maintain somebody else's code because it is kind of checked and it conforms to a agreed set of rules, right? Right, so lint is a big deal. You will use lint in this course. Uh, we do enforce certain rules and some, some certain uh, linter rules and we do check it. So if you code that you submit for your assignments has some linter warnings or errors, yes, that's a problem, right? You should not have that. You should not have the, the problems. And of course the Go doc, which generates the documentation. Many programming languages have the built-in uh, documentation. You know, you have in C, C++, you have Doxygen. Uh, and then in Haskell, you have Hadoc. In, in Go, you have Go doc and, and so on. So it's the same with Java, you have Java doc. Uh, there are certain like markers and certain conventions of how you write comments. And then based on that, the uh, the runtime system generates the documentation for your project. So those are the um, the built-in. Let me, yeah. So um, Golang also has a built-in testing framework such that you can easily write unit tests uh, in Golang and you don't need an external library. So for example, in Java, you have to use JUnit to do unit tests. Um, in C++, you need um, you know, uh, CUnit. Uh, and then you, um, in some other programming languages, you do need to have an external dependency on testing. In, in Golang, it's kind of built in. So the unit testing library is built in and then you have a com command, which is go test which runs the tests and uh, tells you uh, if they all passed. And also you can check what is the test coverage. We, we will cover that uh, next week. So I will show you some of the tests and how you calculate test coverage. And we expect you to report what is the test coverage of some of your solutions that you will submit as your assignments. And the same for the project. Um, it is a good practice to have a target, you know, it's unrealistic to always expect that you have 100% test coverage. That's, you know, un unrealistic and undesirable. Uh, but when you're de developing a project, you have certain quality metrics. And one of those quality metrics might be that you set yourself a target to have 60% of your code base covered by tests. And you pick, you know, the most important 60% and then using kind of a go test and cover, uh, you can measure uh, which parts of your code base are tested and what is your overall test coverage and what are the elements of your, of your code base which are not tested such that maybe you need to write additional tests for that because you consider those parts important, right? So that, that's kind of built in and it's quite useful. And the ecosystem is growing. So there are more uh, Go tools which are useful and um, for example, with Linter, the, with this one, you have kind of a, a really large number of different tools that, for example, measure the cyclomatic complexity of your methods or your functions or measure some other characteristics of your source code. And then based on that, you can kind of make some decisions or some adjustments. Um, so, you know, cyclomatic complexity is like how complex your, your functions are. If you have a lot of nested if statements, they are mentally difficult to read and maintain. And then the cyclomatic complexity metric kind of reports a kind of a high number for those methods or for those functions, such that it suggests that maybe you need to rewrite it in sort of a simpler way. Uh, maybe there is no simpler way. Maybe the way you've coded it is the only way to eff efficiently or effectively code it, but maybe it isn't. So those additional metrics kind of help you to make your code of a higher quality. All right, what do we use for programming in Go? Um, it's up to you. Uh, as the course was suggesting, you can use, um, so if you go to, let me go to, oh, sorry, no, wrong browser. Um, if you go to JetBrains, um, you will see that they have a kind of a spe specialized uh, tool 
for um, Golang, which is called Golent. So Golent is um, is a special purpose IDE uh, for developing and uh, running Go. Um, we've used it in the past, but uh, and a lot of students use it, uh, but. Some of you do need to program in other programming languages as well. And then if you do need to have an IDE where you use Java, Python, Go, Haskell, Rust, and so on, having a dedicated IDE and environment for each language is first of all, a little bit, um, you know, you have to maintain and update all of them. Um, so it's a, a bit of a pain. Um, so in that case, what I suggest is you install the IntelliJ Ultimate, um, and you just install the uh, additional plugins. So there is a Go plugin, which makes this ID almost the same as this one. Uh, some of the menu things are slightly different, but the functionality is basically the, effectively the same, such that you can reuse a single environment for coding in other programming languages. Um, but it is up to you. I'm, I'm using this solution with the uh, built-in uh, plugin. And it, it works uh, quite quite fine, uh, but you can alternatively use this if you want to. Um, what else can you use? Um, that's right. So Espen is asking, do you get Ultimate for free as a student? Yes, you will. Uh, you just need to make in the JetBrains account when you will be downloading it. Um, you kind of need an account and then use your NTNU email and then automatically you will get the uh, license for the ultimate version. And it is renewed every year as long as you're using the same email. Uh, so as a student, you can, you can get ultimate uh, for free. And as a staff members, we also get it for free. Uh, what else? Um, some people use Visual Studio Code with a uh, Go plugin. Uh, so I can kind of show you here as well. I am using Visual Studio Code 2. Um, and it's a little bit smaller. Uh, so you may uh, like it a little bit more. It has the, it has the syntax highlighting. Uh, it has all the facilities. Um, yeah, it has all the facilities here as well. Uh, it is a little bit not as integrated with the debugger and with the um, running of the projects within the environment itself as IntelliJ. So like if you want to use more advanced features like you know running some functions, running tests, uh, debugging, then IntelliJ is better. Uh, but if you only want to manage your project and kind of edit your source code, and then you are fine in you know compiling and building it through the command line, then that's perfect combination. So I, I often do that. Like I, I use it as a editor such that I have an overview of my project and I'm editing here and I have all the warnings and things kind of in the IDE. But I tend to build my projects um, using kind of command line um, for various reasons. One reason is that I often have to pull the project on a server site where I don't have the ID and I have to build it by manually by hand such that I want to always make sure that the builds here, they don't have additional dependencies or some things that the configured ID has that I don't have on the command line. Um, but uh, yeah, you know, it's uh, entirely up to you. Like uh, you should play with whatever uh, options you are familiar with and you, um, you should use what makes you more productive. So I, you know, for large projects, I use IntelliJ. For some small maintenance tasks, I use uh, Visual Studio Code or Vim. Uh, I like Vim uh, because it's fast, it's sort of small, it has uh, some of the features already built in like the compiler problems, highlighting and things like this. Um, and you can use those of you who use Vim, uh, wrong browser again. Those of you who use Vim, I do recommend um, there is a, um, a Vim Bootstrap um, page, and you can pick uh, what programming languages you want your Vim to support. And then if you configure plug, 
then you can uh, make, you know, you can pick Go, Haskell, C, um, TypeScript, whatever, yeah, Rust, uh, JavaScript, and then it will generate the uh, .vimrc file for you. You just drop it into your home folder if you're on Mac or on Linux. I'm not sure about the uh, Windows people, if, if you guys are using Vim or not. Uh, and then it makes the environment like, uh, you know, like I have. So if I open a, a file in, in Golang, then it has all the syntax highlighting. Uh, it has uh, warnings, like if I uh, do something illegal in the language, so it will kind of a highlight, oh yeah, you know, you're probably doing something wrong. And it has uh, syntax suggestions and um, I, for small things, it's fine. Uh, for large, for larger things, as I said, I tend to use um, I tend to use where is the I tend to use IntelliJ because it's heavy. Uh, I I never use IntelliJ if I'm on battery on my laptop uh, because it will drain your battery like you know like there is no tomorrow. But um, if I'm plugged in and I'm working on a large project, that's the most con comfortable for me. And uh, there is a suggestion in the chat to download a Vim extension to uh, VS Code and to IntelliJ, which I did actually. So I, I have a, a Vim extension both in uh, Visual Studio Code and in IntelliJ such that I have the, uh, the normal. Um, so if I open this, you will notice that I have um, I have uh okay so i have the 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 mode so i'm kind of in an editing mode now uh where i have the x to delete the character and then if i do a um yeah i have some missing um missing updates for the go support but i do use vim kind of uh keyboard bindings here as well um, so it like uh, Visual Studio Code will ask you if you're missing some of the things to uh, to install them, uh, and apparently I, I have something either missing or outdated. So what version should you use? Uh, I'm using uh, fifteen. Ay, 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 ay. I'm using 15.6. I I've checked there is a 15.7, which is the latest stable. Um, you can use the um, the 16 beta, but we're not gonna use any of the new features from the language. I don't think in this course. So you can stick to either 15.6 or 15.7. Should be fine. Um, we're using some of the new error features from 15, such that you should not use anything older, but uh, 15, 6, 15, 7 should be fine. Um, all right, so let me close this. Uh, yeah, you can save this. Uh, there are other options. So you can, uh, you can try other things um, and I, what I do recommend is that you try more than one because you should not just try one and stick to it. You should try more than one and get some feel of the differences such that you get a better you know, feel of what suits you more and where you can use a different tool for yourself. Um, there is Atom, um, you know, Notepad, things like this. Um, I, I tend to use command line quite a lot uh, because I like to see um how it works behind the scene like id hide certain things from you so id will run commands for you and sometimes will pass some parameters and some things to those commands and you don't see it necessarily of course you can sort of dig through all the ide features and you know uh, find everything but I'm kind of a bit old school, so I, I tend to do things a little bit by hand, like using Git and using uh, compilers, I tend to use command line. Uh, but yeah, when I'm using IntelliJ, I do run it like within the in, in, uh, integrated environment and I test things as well. 
Uh, I use the command line in Vim. So if I'm using kind of Vim, uh, I, you know, I do terminal. So I open a terminal here. So I have, um, you know, I have my uh, project here. I can do go, go run or go build and so on. And then I can kind of uh, go to the editor and, and work in the editor. So I do that on Mac and in Vim. Uh, on Mac, you have the, the terminal um, command such that you open the, um, the terminal. Um, depends what operating system you're using. If you're using, um, so let me close that. If you're using Linux, uh, you have uh, various options. Yeah, command on Windows will do, yes. You can have uh, on Windows 10, you can have bash support as well. So you, you kind of vary, you have different backgrounds. Uh, those of you who are more on the programming kind of side of the spectrum, I think you should use something that has command line support and something that you are comfortable because you will be spending some time on Linux and on the server logged in. Uh, such that being comfortable with using command line is, is a skill that you will need. Uh, some of you might be coming more from like a game um, background and looking into a kind of a game industry, then, well, you will be using IDs, you will be using Unity, you will be using kind of integrated development environments, and you may not need to deal with command line that much. Uh, some of you kind of come from DevOps and more sort of, uh, um, full stack development. And then, yes, of course, you will have to deal with database. You will have to deal with uh, a lot of activities in the command line. So, and Christopher has um, some modules in the in the cloud course to get you up to speed with Bash and with the Linux command line. So you can do most of your development on Linux actually, because you can um, uh, run the tools like you can run your ID on Windows, commit your, your stuff into Git, through Git to, to the repositories, and then actually build and deploy on, um, on the Linux or you know, a virtual machine uh, through the command line. Uh, there is one really neat trick. So for example, um, in Goal, if I, like, I have this hello world, right? So if I say go run, uh, it will... Um, So if I say go build command main, it's a multi um, package. Um, I do have some problems here with the, let me try something. Right, so I've built, um, Right, so I've built the but there is no executable. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. So I know what the problem is. So let me redo it. So if I go, go build command, um, hello world. I was using main.go, but I don't have that, that file. So that's what the problem was. Uh, so now if I list it, I have my executable. And by default, uh, go build, builds it for the platform that I'm on, right? So if I kind of now run it, I will it will print hello world uh, to in the console, right? But I'm on Mac, right? So if I check what file format it, it is, so if I check uh, what that file is, it says it's a 64-bit uh, Mac executable, uh, right? Um, but uh, what you may want, you may want to build it on Linux. 
uh, and Go runtime system and the compiler has the cross compiling tool chain already built in, such that you can uh, you can build um, you can build for other platforms. I think I have to. Um, I might need to do that. Um, I'm using fish and with that one, yeah, let me just quickly check. Go build, help. Go build, help build. Go help build. Uh, there is a flag that you need to put, um, and then it will compile your executable to the platform that you want. So if you say uh, Linux, it will compile it for Linux. If you say uh, Windows, it will compile it for Windows, uh, such that you don't need a Windows environment or um, uh, Linux environment to get it cross compiled. I don't remember what the syntax was, but you know, at the moment it's not that important. Uh, it, it's kind of like a, it's a goose a go OS. Um, yeah, so maybe that's the way I need to call it. So if I, yeah, that's the, so I, I had it in the history of the commands that I use. So um, I'm using kind of like a, a bash extension, which is called fish, and it changes the way you handle the environmental variables. Uh, so you don't say env or set, you, you just do it like, um, let me uh, highlight it here, yeah. So now I, I, again, I've built the executable, which is called hello world. And if I check what hello world is, uh, so it said, uh, let me remove it. Hello. Let's remove it. Let's rebuild it. Um, and check what it is. So now, before it was a Macintosh executable, and I could run it on Mac. And now I have a Linux Elf 64 bit executable, statically linked. Excellent. Everything is in the single package. And I cannot run it anymore, right? It will say, well, you, wait a minute, you're on Mac, you cannot run Linux executables. Um, the cool thing about this is that um, this executable on Linux is completely self-contained, which means it doesn't depend on any other libraries or anything. It's kind of um, within itself, which means for this course, it's an excellent news because when you will learn about Docker and using Docker containers, what you can easily do, you can package it up as a single service using Docker uh, from the from this executable and and run it, uh, you know, as a um, as, as a service in your Docker system. Uh, so GoLang is quite neat because you can really easily build some web services, which you then use a very tiny um, Linux image uh, from Docker and kind of package it up into a self-contained single uh, single service. So you can kind of uh, do a, kind of a service-oriented architecture and architect your project and such in, in those kind of a tiny executables. And as you see, it's not like, yeah, okay, hello world is not doing much. So it's actually, pretty much doing nothing, but it is um, about um, two megs, which is the entire runtime system for the, um, for, for Go, right? Docker was written in Golang, by the way, as well. All right, so let's move on um, because I'm kind of um, di digressing too much. So, Question for you, uh, how are you gonna learn a new programming language? What are the strategies, the things that you can do to learn, to teach yourself a new programming language? 
<laughs> trial and error i don't think so <laughs> i mean yes you can but that's sort of a, a very inefficient way uh of, of doing it so learn by doing yeah um so uh let me um yeah so let, let's go through that so uh try and error error writing fist bus um those are okay but not the most efficient uh stack overflow that tends to be okay but if you don't know about the language yet at all it's very hard for you to distinguish stack overflow answers which are really bad and not idiomatic in the language and answers which are very good and idiomatic in the language okay so you will realize that stack overflow has kind of a spectrum of answers and some of them are really shit and some of them are really good and when you're learning a new language you can't really distinguish which one is which so stack overflow at the very beginning is not the best because you may learn things that are wrong that you should not do uh, because you just happen to find an answer which is kind of shit so if you have an answer which is very highly upvoted uh, and it doesn't have an answer further down which is not as highly upvoted and says yeah that should be the correct answer then typically you can consider yeah maybe that's a good answer but if you have some small answers which are not very you know well vetted i would a, a, you know, consider a caution uh, with stack overflow. Uh, learn the basics and experiment, sure. Uh, repetition, sure. Um, yeah, recreate programs that you've made in other languages. That's an excellent point. So that's uh, how I learn programming languages too. I just have some programs that I've done in one of them or two of them, and then I re redo them in new one. Um, YouTube tutorials are, are fine, so YouTube is mentioned. Um, although I, I have a note on that. Um, comparing to other languages sometimes is useful. So for example, for Go, it's useful. Uh, although it's useful to know where those languages differ. Uh, we will come back to that. Um, Code Academy is very good. Read documentation is very good. Pair programming is very good. Uh, yeah, making yourself a pet project is excellent. So what I have is the tour, the Golang tour. So those of you who joined at 8.15, I already told you, uh, if you go to tour.golang.org, you will go to the interactive um, tutorial. And if you don't have internet, but you've already installed Go, you can also say in your shell, go to tour and it will run the interactive tutorial for you on your local machine without internet access. So you can kind of do that locally if you, you know, in the location without internet, you can do that. If you're with internet, you can just go with your browser directly to the website. Um, and how to learn new programming languages. So you, you covered it, you know, pick a small pet project and implement something in the new language. And I encourage all of you to do that, right? So, um, um, pick something that you want to have or something that you've done in the past and try to implement it in Golang first. Make it small um, such that, you know, it doesn't take you too, too long time. Um, read tutorials, read books uh, before you go to Stack Overflow because the tutorials and books will teach you the more idiomatic way of using the language. Stack Overflow is great reference, like if you forgot some syntax or if you forgot something, that's fantastic. But it's not that great for learning the language because as I said, it often has answers which are kind of incorrect. It will work, but it will not be the way you should use the, um, the language. And then um, YouTube is great, but you should be very selective of what you watch on YouTube as well. And I've noticed that if you find people that love that particular language, they, you, you will recognize them. It's, it's not a tutorial of Rust. It's a guy or in Golang. It's, it's, a, it's a guy who loves Go. Um, and you know, then watch his channel or his tutorials uh, because 
those people, uh, he or she, they, they will go kind of in depth. They will go into idiomatic way of doing things and they will kind of teach you about the language kind of in depth. So, so find the YouTubers who love that particular language and watch them. Uh, don't just Google for tutorials. Uh, you know, <laughs> initially Google for tutorials, but then filter out all the tutorials out and just find the, the people who are in love with that particular language and then you will learn quite a lot. Um, there are a couple of questions in the chat. So can you run multiple packages in the same directory? Uh, we're gonna do it right now. And the answer is no, you can only have one package per directory. Um, and that's the reason why I have this command kind of directory for the main package. I will explain in a minute. Uh, what sort of service can be made using Go? Any service. So you can do anything that involves networking or JSON or web services and so on. You, you, will, you will see later on. We will be doing a number of example projects, small projects for uh, reading some um, web APIs and doing something with the data. Uh, but you know, it's a general purpose language. You can write anything desktop on it and server side. It doesn't necessarily have a really easy built-in um, GUI support for the desktop applications uh, because it was not designed as an application development. It was designed as a service development language such that it's easy to do services using a web interfaces and web uh, frontends. But on the desktop, yeah, you sort of are limited to command line. Uh, I, 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 I haven't done any desktop uh, project. I know there is the OpenGL bindings in Golang and there are kind of a widgets toolboxes and so on. And you can do desktop applications in Golang as well, but it, it's not the primary goal of that language. So let's, uh, let's do this hello world thing. Um, so I, I already have it here. And uh, the, the first thing you need to learn is that you, you, know, you, you edit files which have the extension dot go. Um, so if I go to command and open my project and my, my program and my program is called hello world dot go. Um, and then I have my initial um, application. So I will, for, for, for now, I will kind of, um, I will uh, comment that out and I will import. So to print stuff out, you have to import a format package. So um, those are the, the, the packages that you reference. And then this is um, the package that you're currently developing. Um, and I will comment that out. Um, and I will just say format uh, print line, hello world, all right, uh, world. And you notice a couple of things. So first thing is that a uh, print line is very similar to, to Java. Uh, strings are double quoted strings, very similar. The brackets we already discussed, the entry point for your programs is always the main function. It doesn't return anything and doesn't take any parameters. Uh, it's just, just main, no parameters, no return. Um, we import stuff using the import statement. And if you want your main to be executable, it has to be in the main package. So uh, you cannot really have main, I, I mean, you can have main function in another package, but it will not be entry point to your executable um, such that if you want an entry point to your executable, it has to be called uh, called main inside the main package, right? And there is no semicolons at the end of the, the lines. So it, it is very similar to C or Java, uh, but no semicolons, strings are the same. Um, and then if we import something, then we use the same prefix for calling functions from that module, right? So we, we imported a format FMT, and then to run functions from FMT, we say FMT dot, and then we call the functions on it, right? So if I uh, save it, and now if I say go build uh, hello world.go in this folder that I am in, in here, it's uh, generated the executable for me and I can run it, right? 
So that's all nice. And I'm kind of inside a single folder and I have inside that single folder, I have one package. Um, what if I want to create, a, so I will copy, I will not type it because I, unfortunately I have that called hello world as well. So I will call it uh, utils.go. So now I am here, I have two files in my project. I have the original hello world.go, which is the, this main entry with the main package. Um, and it's another uh, function, uh, another file that I have here, which is called utils. And utils has a different package. The package is called hello world. It imports format as well. And it has a single function called hello world, which prints stuff to the screen, right? So I will open, I will open both in the editor such that I can quickly switch between them and you will see what I'm doing. So I have utils and utils is this, uh, let's make it bigger slightly. Um, so it is kind of like a utility package that defines a single function for me. Uh, one thing to note here is that the functions in the modules can be capital letter or small letter. Uh, capital letters are exported outside such that I can call them from other packages. Small letters are hidden such that they are internal to the package only. So you can differentiate what is your public API and what is your private API by just convention of naming your functions with capital or small letters. So for example, you can see that in the format module um, or format package, I have um, a capital P because P is exported away such that I can use it from a different, a different package, right? Uh, and then I, so that's in my utils and then in hello world go, I have main function and I have a package package main, right? Um, and you will notice that um, the, um, you know, the, the go complaints, okay? So if I uh, rename, like now I want to import uh, hello world and I don't want to import um, format anymore and I want to call hello world uh, function. So I'm um, like, before I was importing format and calling print line. Now from my own module, I want to import that function. And here it kind of looks as it, as it works okay uh, but here it complains. And the reason why it complains is because I have a single folder um, and I have two source files and one is from the package main and one is from the package hello world. And you cannot have that. Um, in a single folder, you can only have stuff from a single package. So everything in a single folder has to be the same package. Um, it, you, you cannot mix multiple packages, right? So because of that, I, can, I cannot have this. So what, yeah, so I will remove the utils. <laughs> Um, and I will remove the executable. So now what I have is I have a single for, I remove the Visual Studio crap as well. I will close that before I remove this. Okay, so now I have a single file, which is in, in my package main, and it has to live in a different folder than my utils library. Right. So what I will do is I will keep um, I will keep my executable by convention. Um, we tend to have projects which have command and the command um, stores all the executable packages which are called main. So everything in command will be in the package main. Uh, and then by convention, because I uh, so if you list my command, you will see that I named it hello world. 
So this name will become the name of the executable. So if you have multiple executables in your project, you can basically call those executables different names here in, inside command. And then when you build, the, the build command will generate all those ex executables with those names of those files. So it's kind of like a convention for storing all the main executables inside a command and then building them with the names that they, they have as a first part of the, of the source code. Uh, and then in here, like in the top level, um, so let me tidy it up. Uh, I will remove the executable again because that's not part of the project. And then in here, I, I have a space where I can call, um, I can have additional packages or additional uh, source files, but all source files here will have to have the same package, right? So I have a source file called hero world again, which is kind of the same name as, as my command, but this name is because I have some, um, I, I kind of named my package hello world, right? That's so trivial that you know, the package name and the source file name are the same, but I could have multiple files here and they all, if they all live in a hello world package, they, that, that would be fine, right? So if I created a new folder, so if I, um, if I make a new directory, like uh, go toys, for example, um, then I have my top level folder, which I have the top level package, which has some sort of name. And then in here, I would have some other package that would have kind of a go toys name. And then the, the files which come here would be in the package, which would be called go toys. Uh, so those conventions are kind of enforced by, by Golang. It may feel a little bit um, confusing, but it's kind of like in Java. Uh, so you, you, know, you have folder structure, which forms kind of a, a namespace for your packages. And then just to make the executable because executable require everything to be in the main package, we group them into the command folder and then everything here would be just main. Um, there is, th this kind of covers the concept of packages and there is a concept of module and module is a collection of packages. So all of this, my go toys, my hello world, and my commands packages, like you know, three packages, they form a single module. And then you initialize the module by saying go mod in it. Uh, and then you give it a name, like what module is it, right? Uh, I could call it toys, or I could call it hello world, or I could call it whatever I want. And that would become the name of the module. And then modules are the unit which gets um, exported or imported. So it's a kind of the, the, um, the unit that gets distributed as a dependency. So it, it forms either a system or a library. And we kind of talk about dependencies on modules, right? So um, there is a version of the module. There is a um, dependency tree of what this module uses, what modules it uses and so on. And for, for managing modules, you have in, since goal 13, I think uh, you have this kind of a module manager. And when you say go mod in it, it initializes the module and then it creates this um, go mod file. So if I show you what my go mod file looks like, it says, okay, my module is called hello world. <clears throat> And I'm not dependent on anything else, but I'm kind of dependent on at least Go 1.13, right? I can change that. Um, so I could change that to say, we're gonna use some features from Go 15. So I am now dependent on, um, on 1.15. And if you have, if you did some imports in your project that require dependency, what you would say is you would say go um, mod tidy and it would check what imports you're making and if go needs to download the, the imports that you are dependent on. Um, we, will, we will kind of come back to that later on. So the, the bottom line here is that there is a concept of packages, which is basically folders with source codes and the, the package name 
uh, of the of the package and those source code files. There is a special purpose package called main, and that's called for executables for entry point to your to your executables. The entry point in your source files is uh, called main, um, and um, the module is a collection of packages, right? It was kind of a bit quick, and I will commit the the, the structure of this into the uh, into the repository um, into the main repository of the uh, of the course, such that you can have a look. Um, if you if you're doing the go tour, it goes it, it talks about uh, packages and um, yeah it talks about the packages and the special meaning of package main and how you organize your your um, your packages and the package kind of uh, paths right so I can have a package inside another package so there is a package called math rand and then there is a folder structure kind of math slash rand right so you can see here that we we kind of following the the convention all right so that was a quite fast uh introduction to hello world printing and to um packages and modules but the good thing is that We've, we've wrote hello world on the screen. We rewrote it such that the function was in a different package and we could use it from main. And also we, we've done it such that the, um, uh, the function was its own module, uh, its own package, right? So the next step would be if you exported this module, the hello world module, and use it in another module, right? Uh, for that, you need a, another top level folder, and you would have a dependency on an external module. And then how, how would you do that? Well, in Go, you do that through Git. So it's very similar to Rust. Uh, all the external dependencies are managed through Git URLs, such that you would say, I need to import this particular hello world pack module from a certain location, which means I would have to commit my module to Git, and then somebody would make a reference to that Git repository to make this dependency, right? So format is a module, yes. So um, yeah, so format, strictly speaking, is a package, which is part of a larger module, right? Uh, because as you see here, um, so uh, let me vim hello world. So here, um, I'm not, I'm not importing um, anything that has to do with Git. It's a standard library package that I'm importing, and that's why I only have quotes, right? I I don't have a go Git kind of a, a path here. Uh, same uh, if I quit that and go vim command and the hello world here. Same here, I'm, I'm importing a package, uh, hello world, because it lives in the same module I'm in. So it is kind of treated as part of the standard library because I'm in a module called, I called it hello world, confusingly enough, uh, but in that hello world module, I have a package which is called hello world. And here I'm in, uh, importing a package, not a module. Uh, if, um, yeah, so let me, Kill that, and if I go to, for example, rest hello, and let me see, uh, cut main. No, those are all, uh, let me just find a more complex. Um, yeah, that, that will be, so if I vim main.go, ah, that one also doesn't have any imports which are external. Uh, th those are all packages. Um, I, I don't have an example. I will prepare an example for tomorrow where I, I am importing a module. So to answer Avet, a format is a package, not a module. Um, all right, so 
we are running out of time. I have um, I have a couple of more slides. Uh, so I will kind of quickly use another two minutes to run through that, uh, such that I can close this um, this Mentimeter session. Um, I literally have uh, four more slides. So um, you can do object-oriented programming in, um, in Golang. And for that, uh, we will do some examples tomorrow, but we will use structs, methods, and interfaces. Um, they are very similar to uh, to Java. Um, so there is a question, does every Go file has an entry point in a form of main? No. So you can have, you, you can only have entry point in a form of function main in the package main, such that in your other packages, you will not have a main function because uh, main can only be, be in the main package. Um, and all the other packages will not have an entry point, right? They will be used by something that has an entry point, but they will not have an entry point in itself. Um, all right, so coming back to object-oriented patterns, uh, we will, I will show you tomorrow some of those things. Um, and interfaces are very similar to the concept of an interface in Java uh, and, and some other programming languages. So you, you basically have a, a method signature, which defines what type of methods can be called on something, uh, but you don't have the implementation. The implementation comes with the type that, that, that implements that interface, okay? So here is a, a kind of a, a quick example of an interface call, called geometry, which has a single method called area, which returns a, a high precision float. Um, and then we have a struct, uh, which is a rectangle. We have a struct, which is a circle. And then we have the area, which is the geometry interface implemented for rect and for circle. I will talk a little bit more in, in details tomorrow about this. The, the concept here is that we can use structs and interfaces to implement something similar to object-oriented programming. And we don't need to declare that this particular struct implements this interface. It is kind of a de facto implementing that interface because it has this method. So if something implements the methods that you want in a particular interface, you can cast it to that interface. Uh, you don't have to say that circle implements this interface. You just implement the, the methods of a particular interface and then circle magically will be castable to that type, right? So it is different than in Java because in Java you have to be explicit. You have to say my type circle implements that interface. And if you don't say it, but it has some methods of, of this interface, it will not be castable to that, to that interface, right? So, it makes some things more dynamic, but it is still strictly type language. Like the, the type system will infer uh, that circle is castable to, to that particular interface. All right, and then um, there is, uh, you know, um, functions. So um, we, we did, you know, played with functions already. Uh, and like in the previous, uh, um, um, diagram or code listing, you, you know, functions are declared with a, a word func, and then there is a, a name of the function, parameter list, and return types. We will do a little bit more tomorrow. And for this particular functions, we have this weird thing here, which is a type specifying kind of a particular uh, struct. So this is a notation for methods on that struct. Um, so we have functions which don't have it at all, like we had with the um, with the main, right? So we have uh, we have a func main uh, that doesn't take any parameters and doesn't return anything, and you know you have a body uh, of the method or of the function. You could have a function which is like f. So function name is f. It takes a single integer and returns an integer. And you could say, you know, uh, return 10. So this function f 
is called f takes integer returns integer. And here you have just one extra notation, which is there is a, a, a function area, which actually operates on this particular struct. Uh, and we call those methods because when you do that, then if, if I have like, so if I have, for example, uh, a person type person here, and I said there is F on the type um, P, which is a uh, reference to person, uh, then what I can do later on, I can say, uh, if I have a P as a reference to person, I can say PF and call it with the integer. Right, and that's why it's called a method because I'm calling this function on behalf of a particular struct. Um, so that's all. Uh, we are gonna cover more on functions tomorrow, uh, and we will. Um, uh, there is a question: Can you implement multiple structs inside a method? So no, you can't. You have to implement methods on behalf of the struct. So it's, uh, you know, for this struct, I have this method. And for this struct, I have this method. And they just happen to have the same name. And they just happen to be the same name as my interface, which means my rect, which is my uh, rect struct, and my circle struct will be both geometry, right? So I can kind of cast, um, cast them to geometry and called print area on rects and on circles. Right, uh, so this method takes geometry instances, and the instance can be either a rect or a struct because they both implement the geometry interface. Uh, and the print area basically calls geometry G area, which calls the method on the G, which in this case is either R or C. Right, so you cannot reuse the, the method. Uh, because it is specific to that particular struct. Like those structs ha have different um, fields. So the implementation of this method for rect obviously has to be different than the implementation of this method for circle. Um, and to complicate things, there is no inheritance, neither, right? So if it happened that uh, circle also has um, you know, uh, x, y coordinates, same as the origin of rect, we could, we, we can do it tomorrow. Then I cannot really inherit um, in the circle from rect, but we, we, we will cover it tomorrow. Any other questions? I'm kind of, yeah, I'm, I apologize that I ran out of uh, time. I was uh, ranting too much, but I was almost, almost on time. <laughs> All right, so homework for you, um, go to um, go tour and kind of familiarize yourself a little bit with the, with the syntax and with some basic structures and basic constructs of, of Go. And what we, what we will do tomorrow, we will talk a little bit more about those object-oriented patterns and the, the methods and about pointers and um, passing by value and passing by, uh, by pointer. Um, so that's all. If you have questions, I am still here. If you have um, no questions, uh, thank you very much. That's all for today and you can, you can go. And I will stop recording and the video of the lecture will be posted into the cloud course uh, class and I will um, and I will also put the Mentimeter link there with the slides. Yes, there is a possibility for asking questions if, if you want to. So I will stop the, the video and uh, you can ask questions and I, I will be still here. <laughs>